Hello, Tonsay. Good afternoon and welcome to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. As I'm sure you have heard, Melissa Ridgen has left us for another opportunity and we wish her nothing but the absolute best. And I will be taking over APTN In Focus this season. Today, we're putting Indigenous chefs in focus. And we always want you to join in on our conversation, so you can email infocus at aptn.ca or you can send us a tweet at aptn in focus on Twitter. So let's just jump right into it. A brand new season of Moose Meat and Marmalade, the sixth in fact, is underway. The smash hit here on EPTN has a bush cook Art Napoleon and classically trained British chef Dan Hayes exploring Western Canada as it was shot during COVID. Usually they're traveling the world exploring indigenous cuisine with a modern touch. And Melissa Ridgen caught up with Napoleon to talk about how COVID affected the show and what's in store for moose meat and marmalade lovers this season. Well, Art, it's always good to have you on and chat about Moose Meat and Marmalade. It's one of our favorite shows here, of course. Um, but you guys were not immune to COVID restrictions shooting this this sixth season. You, so it's primarily in uh, Western Canada. Did you find that restrictive or is that kind of like right up your alley? I mean, you live there, you know, the, the area, like the back of your hand and, and where to get wet and who's who in the zoo? Well, it's from an administrative end, it was very restrictive. We've even had a, a couple of communities bail because um, they were uh, I, uh, isolated and they had uh, blocked off the whole community. And so we had to cancel a couple of, uh, had to rewrite a couple episodes and find new places. So we started out close by, like we did some ones on the island and then we started branching out then we finally made it as far away as the exotic town of North Battleford. <laughs> well, that's pretty That's pretty far from where you're located. Okay, I know that season six uh, kicks off hunting squirrels. I'm slightly scared to ask you about that. And did we eat them? Oh, of course. No! We, always, we <laughs> eat everything we can. I know you do. That's why we love your show, but I don't know. I don't know squirrels, man. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the meat. It's actually pretty good. And I think the people that ate it were really surprised at how good it tasted. I was going for like the the Colonel's recipe <laughs> of idea of 11 herbs and spices. I researched them and I used them on the squirrel meat and uh, people really loved it. It's very similar to rabbit. Okay, which I guess isn't super surprising. How many squirrels would it take to feed a, like one squirrel per person or do we need two squirrels a person? Oh, you only need about one squirrel per person. You cook it in a way where it spreads out, you know. We just made little nuggets and we had some nice uh, other stuff that we had foraged. Well, we yeah, I was going to say, what's, this, what's the sides that go with squirrel? I think I made a mash. Well, I think we roasted potatoes and yams and mashed them with nettle and added some bur nozette or whatever the heck that brown butter stuff is. And uh, it was really good. I love, okay, so does, does Dan ever get fed up with the adventures of some of the things that you come up with for him to eat? I mean, he's a buttoned up, you know, guy, right? Does he ever just look and go, <laughs> I'm not doing that, come on. Well, surprisingly, oh yeah, there was one time he would not eat a uh, seal intestines, but you know, I don't know. He's got a thing about seal intestines. <laughs> he, he ate moose eyeball and he ate moose intestines, but he wouldn't eat seal intestines. That's an interesting line to draw. Moose intestines, yes. Seal intestines, no. <sighs> yeah, I don't. I don't get the logic, but. Moose intestines were really, really tasty. <laughs> well, I have never had them. Um, I used to grow up, my grandma used to cook blood sausage a lot. Right. And I always, let, like, that's a, that's a comfort food to me. I know for, like, in my family, for your birthday, you get to decide, like, what do you want for dinner, right? And uh, blood sausage with mashed potatoes and cream corn used to be one of my go-tos. I, I think my grandma made it for me probably the last time I was in my early 40s. Like that's one of those comfort things, right? 
Well, you know, act, actually, people might be surprised. Dan has uh, been on my res, and he's been around now, so he's really developed a taste for wild game. He's more disgusted when I put a bunch of uh, modern, fancy stuff. He, he, he thinks I should stay rustic and basic and traditional. Well, that's why we love the show. So we're glad that Dan's advocating for the basic rustic traditional. I have a question for you. I've got some, uh, was gifted some deer back straps in my freezer. How should I cook them? I'm worried about them being tough. No, they are, back strap can really never be tough because mus those muscles are not really used. You have to think of the anatomy, you know, back straps, they don't get much exercise. So it's always going to be tender. You know, you don't need to slice. So I slice across the grain, so you end up with these medallions. Okay. As long as you sear it, even uh, just sear the outsides and go for the uh, what's that? Medium, medium rare. Okay. That's how I would serve it. Put some chimichurri sauce or anything you want over top of that. Does it? Does it have to be marinated? Ah, uh, it's so good that it doesn't need marinating. I just okay. usually go with uh, salt and pepper. Uh -huh. But sometimes what I do is I'll dry age steaks. I will wrap each steak individually in a very light cloth, like a cheesecloth, and keep it on the rack in the fridge. Turn it over once in a while. You can go four or five days and it uh, you'll get a crust on the meat that tells you it's ready. And it uh -huh. just adds a lot more flavor. And it actually kind of tenderizes it as well. Doing that. I'm stealing that. Okay, back to season six of moose meat and marmalade. What I'll tag you in pictures when I cook it. If they turn out, if All they right. if I screw it up, I'm not gonna drag you down with me. But if it turns out, I'll tag you. I think the trick will be not to <laughs> overcook it because the uh, you know, it's a tender meat. It's it's soft, it cooks really quickly, and if you overcook it, it's gonna get dry and rubbery. Okay, I was not gonna, I, I want it like rare to medium rare. Okay, so back to season six, moose meat and marmalade. What was your, what was some of the highlights for you? Whether it be places, people, foods that you cooked, what are some of the highlights? Well, I get asked this a lot, but, but you know, everywhere we go, I, uh, it's, it's all favorite to me because yeah. we get to meet cool people that are doing neat things and we get treated like gold usually. Uh, so it's it's a new adventure everywhere we go so there's not no such thing in my mind as something being more exotic i really enjoyed the buffalo hunt in um, the saskatchewan with the pound maker Cree nation nice and then we we'll also enjoyed the boar hunt the wild boar hunt that we did there right near north battleford this, um, i'm assuming wild boar is very strong flavored no no I didn't find it strong at all. It's uh, similar to pork, except maybe a little tiny bit redder, tiny huh. bit stringier, but there's no wild, there's no wild flavor at all. Okay, I'm putting that on my must try list then too. Um, what is, I mean, you've been doing this for six seasons. Is there something that you, like an eye on the prize sort of place or something that you want to, to get into your culinary repertoire? Like if you could pick tomorrow somewhere to go or something to try, what would it be? Well, it would, would be nice to go to um, New Zealand and cook with Maori people or Mexico, uh, Central America, cook with indigenous people there and especially with all the different things you can do with corn and other local plants. That would be cool. Cooking with other indigenous peoples. Like we're on our way to Sweden um, in about two weeks, two or three weeks. And, but we're mostly around the big the Stockholm place. And uh, there's no Mari activities and hardly any Mari people. They're all in northern Sweden. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I didn't know they were that they had settled in Sweden, like moved up to Sweden too. I had no. They're in most. They're they're in most of the Scandinavian countries. You see, you learn something new every day, especially if you're talking to Art Napoleon. And, and the northern be... parts there, like northern Sweden, it would be a lot like northern Alberta, northern northeastern BC. It's the boreal Northwest Territories, Yukon. That boreal forest is mm -hmm. going to be very similar. So they actually have similar game. 
to what we have. They have moose, they have beaver, grouse, the whole nice. bit. And this is this is shooting for season seven now. Yes. Yeah. Season seven. <clears throat> um, you know, there's been such a resurgence in interest among like our foods, traditional foods, foraging, um, medicines. Like, I'm, I'm curious what you've thought, because I've certainly seen it in the past couple of years. You've been probably noticing it over much longer. What are your thoughts? Like, what's behind it? How come now? Well, I think I'm not the only Indigenous chef out there that's kind of going back to traditional food sources. There's a few now. And uh, I think we just naturally have the same kind of philosophy of uh, bringing it more to the forefront and also a lot of us are into food security yeah. food sovereignty being able to protect those traditional foods and if you want to be able to protect that it means you got to protect the habitats and i've always been a land steward mm -hmm. so it fits right in with my life philosophy and i'm glad that there's a new interest in it i would hope that maybe even our show played a little role in that because we do get emails from fans saying wow I didn't know this I didn't know that I was cut off from my reserves I was yeah. 60 scoop and I'm learning so much about our food traditions from your program those are some of the nicest emails we get knowing that yeah. you know we're an inspiration for some no you absolutely are there's a reason why you our guys are one of the top shows here on apt and art thank you for taking the time with to chat with us we look so forward to the further adventures for season six and many more seasons ahead thank you so much viva aptn <laughs> have a good day you two are good to catch up all right, if you're wondering where you can watch Moose Meat and Marmalade airs Tuesdays on APTN, be sure to check your local provider for times, or you can stream it on APTN Lumi. All right, we need to step aside for a short break, but still to come. If you like Indigenous cuisine and seeing Indigenous chefs, you might want to keep an eye on Top Chef Canada this fall. That's coming up. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page, Follow or tweet us at APTN in focus and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. One second. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. I can hear you. Exactly, yeah.
Welcome back to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. If you're a fan of cooking shows, then be sure to check out this season of Top Chef Canada. Tanya Bryant from Six Nations will be competing and she recently made her TV debut this past week. If you're in or near Six Nations near Hamilton, Ontario, you can visit her in Oshuyan at her restaurant where she's serving up Haudenosaunee fusion cuisine. She recently took a break from Cooking Up a Storm to chat with Melissa Ridgen. Tanya, we're so happy to have you join us. Tell us, where are you right now? This looks like where the magic happens. <laughs> right? Uh, you got a little small corner of res here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm on Six Nations. I'm in Uego right now. We're open for service. So if you see some people walking by, it's uh, middle of lunch hour right now. So oh my gosh. we're doing it live. We do everything live. I love it. Roll <laughs> with it. Roll with it, right? Um, okay, before we get to Top Chef, I want to just go back. What got you interested in cooking? I don't know if there was ever like a moment where I was just like, I want to grow up, I want to be a chef, I want to be like, it was just, I think, um, an evolution of my just life. Like, I, I always liked food. I just, like, I can remember like cooking grilled cheese sandwiches at like five years old. And now that I have a five, six, eight year old, like, I, I was just like, Mom, why did you let me touch the stove? <laughs> but she's like, oh, you're okay. <laughs> you're supervised, right? Um, but yeah, it seems like every job I always had just, went back to food like working in high school and everything like i worked at our local bingo hall that was in the concession stand even our arena but that was the concession stand and a local diner and so my first restaurant job was 12 and um yeah just in a local diner here um on six oh, nations yeah. and it just seemed like everything just kind of kept coming back to food for me it's, as i went on and went to school i originally started going to school for like archaeology and uh it just something about it was just like I was like this isn't me but I still love this and so eventually I kind of asked my mom like you know can I go to culinary school and they're like well I guess you can check it out for a year and see what happens yeah. but <laughs> um well so you go know. from from cooking other people's food if you're working in other places what was the evolution to you then cooking like what you want and making your own recipes and coming up with these 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 dishes that are your signature dishes when did that happen uh, well, that's just like, that's the work of a chef, right? Like that's the difference between a chef and a cook. Chefs are making recipes, whereas cooks are using recipes. So basically I don't use recipes, right? And the idea of even making them now and putting on my website different things, I'm just like, you know, it takes effort when it's just like, you're used to just like, I'm going to go in the kitchen and make something. So that, that's a little different, but it did come along um, in terms of working with indigenous foods, didn't come along till probably about 20 years into my career. So wow. I've been working for 28 years in restaurants now. <laughs> um, I just turned 40. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah, so I did. I started young, but it wasn't until be I became a mom where I kind of end up meshing those two thought processes of being raised traditionally and then working in professional kitchens for so many years. And then I started getting requests after I moved home. Like I always lived in and around home, but I wasn't working in the community. So when I started again, I started having a lot of requests for traditional foods. Oh, can you make us some scone? Can you make whatever, right? Corn soup, didn't matter. Um, and so I had another local caterer that I was helping him start his business at the time. And he's like, you can do this too. Like you're doing it for me. Why aren't you doing it for yourself? And I really accredited him. Um, I would say him and my mom, because she was the one growing and seed keeping and just kind of throwing these things at me that even I didn't know what it was growing up. It was just kind of like, here, I can, make, I can do this squash here, go make it happen. <laughs> so that's um, incredible that really to have that support though, you know, from somebody else who, you know, a lot of times in this colonized world we live in, there's, it's very competitive, right? It's like, I'm doing this and I don't want anybody else doing it. So to have somebody who's doing something like that and encouraging you to go do it, put your own spin on it, your own take on it, that's a gift. That's a, that's a real gift to have. In this it, it, it really is, and I and I do have a lot of respect for him in that in that sense that um, that he encouraged that, and and we still work together. Like we get a major event for a thousand people, we're just you know kind of throw our staffs together and make it happen. So being able to do that and uplift other indigenous businesses in my community, like I think like you couldn't ask for anything better, right? And and to have that support, and I just think that that's incredible and. Just to have that business mindset is really is, it is an incredible thing because there is a lot of competition and yeah i my community is so big there's no reason for us to have any competition here there's enough jobs to keep everybody happy I can nice. you that. <laughs> what's your favorite dish to prepare anything i've never made before 
Really? <laughs> it took me it's a long time to come up with first that time, it's, a, it's a first time thrill thing for you. Like, oh, I wonder what this would be yeah. like. That's, that's I'm your not favorite. about beating that old horse of making the same thing <laughs> over and over. And this is my signature. And I, I don't like any of that. I'm just like, when it comes to indigenous food, and that's why I have a daily menu at my shop now, is because I don't know how much I'm going to have of anything. It's harvested, it's fresh, we don't know what we're working with, and that's what I love. I'm just like, okay, what's in there today? That's what we're going to make, right? And I think that's working with indigenous foods has really benefited my chef career because of that, right? Like this mentality. We don't, like, I can walk in somewhere and have every, like $500 ingredients and think it's amazing, but I don't think that that's amazing. I'm just like, that person grew that piece of corn for me, Aww. right? That was forged by somebody's hands to put their their time and their love and all of that into those foods and, and to be able to make them something incredible that they can like take. And I, and I feel like we're eating with our ancestors when we're doing those things and, and we're recognizing them. And we cook our traditional foods for like our feasts and I want to see our traditional foods of that because I feel like our ancestors are the ones that haven't been able to eat these things in a really long time. And oh, I, that's I something for that. me in my career that I find really touching, right? And if I'm cooking, I'm I'm making things that aren't necessarily for me. I'm making things for people that I know are there. I'm going to make my desserts that I know are my grandfather's favorites. And, you know, like those are the types of things that I want to make because I'm not cooking for me when we're doing those things, right? Like you're I cooking love for... That people that are there that even whether you see them or not I want them to be invited right and, and to have them with you when you're cooking really it beautiful. right like they're that's with you while you're preparing it too and then eating and sharing and having that that's I mean I think that that's a lot of people operate like that but I think that it the world would be a better place if more of us did right you know I want to yeah, talk like I've definitely had some pretty interesting experiences <laughs> that way <laughs> really can you share <laughs> any that nobody touched who touched that literally had things like oh in my, my hand so you're not the only one there when you're cooking for like that <laughs> that is amazing um okay yeah. so i want to jump ahead to top chef uh canada this was your first cooking competition um what yeah. was it like i mean i would i would assume it was intense pressure but walk us through like the lived experience <laughs> of it yeah, well, it's a, it's a cooking competition, right? Now, alcohol competitions are designed to be stressful, but this is a reality show cooking competition. Right. So you're doing like two things at once that most people do normally, right? So um, definitely designed to keep you moving on your toes, a little stressed. Like you, you're, you're never comfortable, right? Like if you're comfortable, it's because you're not doing something or you're waiting for something about to happen. So those, those are fun um, to see and experience that. It took me a minute to, you know, get my feet wet and understand, okay, what do they expect of me here? Um, mm -hmm. And I think you'll kind of see that in the series that, you know, and it's just like, just like a good time, right? Like to, to see other chefs, like we don't get time to go out. And like half of us are working 60, 80 hours a week. So <laughs> right. you don't get much time to work with other chefs in that sense, right? So just that was incredible, being able to work with people across the country. You know, I have 10 new friends I can go visit. <laughs> uh, well, we're obviously gonna be cheering for you. Um, last question for you. I wanted to know, you know, there's probably a lot of young budding chefs out there, especially because of these shows like like Top Chef, um, watching and having this in their, uh, in their future or hope for it to be what advice would you have for those young inspiring uh, to inspire those young chefs or for people sitting at home like you know as old people who are getting bored of cooking and maybe mm -hmm. looking for some inspiration to mix things up in our own kitchens not to mm -hmm. do it in a big scale but just for our own families um, would be too like if you want to be a better cook or if you are looking at being a chef like if you're young you're there's never too young an age to start cooking that's always important um, setting those guidelines, being young, that you're going to grow up and eating healthfully and thinking mm -hmm. about your health. That's something I'm really super impressed with right now with adolescents and teenagers that they are really cautious about what they eat. I know that wasn't even on our radars when I was totally. that age. So yeah. that's incredible. And I can't wait to see what these kids do because they've had everything. They've had every flavor, every cuisine, and then they've had them all mixed together too. Yeah. So I think food in terms of where it's going, what our food looks like today is not what you know my kids and grandkids are going to be eating 
and but that's incredible to me because some of those things are going to be our traditional foods that we don't have everyday access to and that's what i would encourage people just to get outside see what's in your backyard you would be so surprised at how many wild edibles are around us all the time and they're just they're forgotten right and as soon as you start recognizing those things they know mushrooms become form plentiful berries start growing in these bunches when they were just sporadic like i feel like those plants feel like they've been recognized and when we do that like that's helping us as well right and we're eating better and we're taking more you know antioxidants and vitamins and things that modern day foods can't even touch for us right yeah like our indigenous foods are so nutrition dense that you know you don't even need to eat a lot of it like that's the thing right you're totally changing everything but just like engaging with your community going to community events and most importantly i mean why aren't foods here have yeah. people in every community we have thousands of talented indigenous chefs across turtle island and like let's use that right let's make our foods better right and that's what i feel like would be the most thing that if we really wanted to encourage people with what they're doing now and how they would do that that would be my thing is just to get out there try it if you want to do this as a career definitely like you have to know your hustle you have to know your worth and you have to be able to prove it so it's like it's a go hard industry and if you want to be success successful at it it's definitely possible but you have to be willing to put in the work i love this tanya you're an inspiration you make me want to go home and break out all my tasty <laughs> goodies that have been harvested so far this summer and make something spectacular thank you for taking time to join us from your busy restaurant and all the best of luck to you we'll be cheering for you this season if you want to learn more about Haudenosaunee foods and, of course, cooking, you can visit chefatanyabrandt.com and watch her at work on, on Top Chef excuse me, Canada every Thursday. You can also subscribe to her YouTube channel. You can search Tanya Brandt for lots of interesting dishes there as well. All right, let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. But before we do that, Jesse, uh, would you have tried that squirrel that uh, Art Napoleon had made? I, I think I would. You know, I, I've got a lot of squirrels in my backyard. I never thought of eating them uh, until I heard that. So uh, I might. What about you? Uh, I always say I'll try something once and uh, depending on how if I like it or not I might uh, not try it again but <laughs> I, have, I have a feeling I might have uh, tried it for it, sure I it would sounded, say try something once it, it sounded good it sounded pretty good right it, it did and the way he made it seem it seemed like it's something that I wanted to try but um, <laughs> anyway Jesse what, what's cooking online on our social medias well Daryl we've actually compiled a list of indigenous cookbooks for our viewers so if you want to try your hand at cooking with traditional ingredients or learning more about our foods these should be able to help. First, we have Modern Feast by Andrew George Jr. Chef George is from the Wet'suwet'en Nation and has been cooking for over 20 years, training and working across Canada. This cookbook takes traditional recipes and updates them to include modern flavors and ingredients. Tawa by Shane Chartrand. Chef Chartrand from Inakri Nation has competed on Chop Canada and currently serves his dishes in the SC restaurant at the River Cree Resort and Casino. Next, we have Where People Feast by Dolly Watts. From the Gitsan First Nation, Dolly ran a restaurant in Vancouver for many years and was named winner of the BC Iron Chef. Dolly, was create, Dolly has created a collection of recipes that shows us how to prepare and preserve wild game and seafood. For, and for those of you in the north or access to northern food, Nikki Lee Nick is a cookbook compiled by five women from Igulik. They combine traditional foods like seal and arctic char with store-bought produce. And if you want to try something from our southern cousins, New Native Kitchen by Freddie Bitsua, the Navajo chef who headed Mits Mitsitam Native Food Cafe at the Smithsonian. This book offers a variety of flavors and a and a bit of food history from across America. Foods of the Southwest Indian Nation by Lois Ellen Frank, a photographer and food expert with help from Navajo chef Walter Whitewater includes traditional recipes that are adapted to modern palates and common ingredients. And lastly from Mexico, Decolonize Your Diet by Luz Cavo, a vegetarian cookbook. It features recipes combining Mexican history and traditional ingredients like corn, beans, squash, and seeds. All these books can be found on Amazon or check, your out, your, check out your local bookstore and library. If you have a favorite cookbook or would like to share your favorite meal, here's how you can do that.
Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. All right, thanks so much for that, Jesse. It's time for one final break here on In Focus. But after the break, we will head on down to America and speak with an award-winning chef who recently won the competition cooking show Next Level Chef. Welcome back to APTN In Focus, I'm Daryl Stranger. Our next chef competed against 14 other chefs from across America for the title of Next Level Chef. Already an award-winning traveling chef, Piet combines her indigenous and Mexican heritage to create her dishes. She recently won Next Level Chef. Let's take a look at that. But only one of you is about to become the first ever Next Level Chef. That comes with a check for a quarter million dollars and an extraordinary, unprecedented one-year mentorship to help take your dream to the next level. The person who will be our next level chef. Pick me. Please pick me. I really, really want this. I still have so much more to give and prove. I want to win so badly. It's time. It's time. Congratulations goes to... Piet! I 
know what I've come from. I know the battles. I know the grit and the fight that I put out. Living out of my car, trying to make this dream happen. Oh my God. I never thought to myself that I was capable of doing something like this. I am the next level chef. Yet that last course was the show winner. Absolute utter perfection. That's just amazing. Uh, a member of the Osage Indian Reservation in Oklahoma. She is based in Los Angeles where she started her business, Piet's Plate, promoting nutrition and food quality. She sat down with Melissa Ridgen and served some hot tea that you'll only hear right here. Check it out. Piet, we're so thankful that you could join us. It's, I, I just have so much admiration for you, uh, and I have a million questions about being on the show uh, and Gordon Ramsay, but we'll start at the beginning, which is, how did you get your start cooking? What, what was the, the initial spark that set the fire? For me, the um, interest really started building when I was a child. I grew up with family members that loved to cook. I had um, two uncles that owned restaurants and my grandmother was a baker. And so everyone on my dad's side of the family, my Mexican American side, everyone was just really passionate and competitive about cooking. You know, they wanted to make sure that they knew their their recipe was better than everyone else's <laughs> in the family. And uh, so that's really how it started with just the actual act, action of cooking. But also on my Native American side, uh, my indigenous side, there's a lot of celebration that happens around the table. And um, it's very important that the families are being taken care of. You know, the women mm -hmm. would go, go out and regardless if it was like the heat or if it's raining outside during powwow season or ceremony season or any ceremonies that we would have, the families would come together and eat together. But the women were always, you know, at the, at the stove cooking for our, the families. And so there's just these two cultures that I grew up in that were both like very passionate about food and the food represented different things, uh, whether it be ceremonial or cele celebratory. And so that's really how um, the passion started kind of stirring up, but it wasn't until I became a young adult that I actually started taking it serious. And I was like, oh, you know, I like doing this thing. I love cooking. But growing up, it was just a lifestyle. Everyone right. cooked, you have these huge families, you have lots of cousins and aunties and uncles, but um, it wasn't until I started um, really dibble, like dabbing in different cuisines and trying different flavor profiles that my passion for food really, really started to grow. And then I went to culinary school and then it was just kind of ignited from that point on. I, I knew that the kitchen was a sacred place for me and it was a place where I belonged. And I was, I was happy to be there. So you're literally doing what you love to do. Oh my gosh, yeah. I'm so incredibly grateful and blessed because I know there's a lot of people in the world that are constantly searching for their purpose or their passion. And I get to wake up and eat, breathe, and do it every single day of my life. So I'm so incredibly eat, grateful. Eat, breathe, sleep, cook, and then eat what you've cooked. Yeah, you've got it going on. You've got a good system going there. How long have you been doing it for now? So it's about six years I've been doing it professionally going yeah. into seven years. Okay, so one of the clips that I had seen, uh, I wanted to ask you about you. You were talking about bison, cooking with bison on the show, and uh, you know you made a point of saying you know the bison were killed off as a way of getting rid of the Indian problem. Really, how important is it for you to be using your platform for education like this? Well, there's a lot of history that is unknown to the mass public, and yeah. so you know, in history books in school, we're only taught a one side story which isn't all the way true and so i love being able to tell the story of the food and not just the story of my of my ancestors and my people but also celebrate where we are as indigenous people and celebrate where our food is you know it's been many years of being able to evolve and adapt and um, we're kind of working our way backwards myself and other chefs that are doing this work and so it's so incredible Incredible to be able to utilize these ingredients that once were forgotten or almost killed off. Right. And it's 
thanks to our and like my ancestors and the original people that occupied this land that knew how important that connected relationship was to the food to bring that food into you know their their future and so you have an an example of that is the in the trail of tears where the um, indigenous people that were on that path the women would sow the seeds of pumpkins and rice and dried beans or not rice um corn mm -hmm. and they would put those seeds in their skirts so when they traveled they would travel with that food had it not been for those women taking the food with them maybe you know who's to say some of that food wouldn't wouldn't have been left behind and so it's just it's really amazing to be able to grow as a chef but also learn these stories of the food in a way it's um the food is kind of calling me to to kind of be a, a vessel for them or a messenger of like here's our history and so i look at it as these are our plant relatives and i'm just here as the messenger to help st tell the story of their of their legacy i love this so much what are some of the other favorite traditional uh ingredients that you like cooking with what, what would you what you what would we see most incorporated into what you're creating in the kitchen so aside from the three sisters, which is born, uh, beans, corn, squash, I utilize a lot of, lot of, lot of corn in my food, but also um, wild game. And so mm. I grew up, my my uh, grandfather was a hunter. And so he would bring lots of elk and deer meat to our, our family and say, here's this meat. You know, we'd have, we'd have pounds and pounds of deer meat in our refrigerator. So I Spoiled. eat a lot of wild game. <laughs> I know. So I eat a lot of wild game and I like to, like to bring a lot of those um, unfamiliar foods into my cuisine and really educate people on exactly what survival foods are and so I'm learning a lot about plants at the moment I kind of geeking out on things like that nice. and I'm I, I love going to the farmers market and just picking the brains of the farmers and asking them questions about you know different weeds and different greens and utilizing them in my in my cuisine so things like wild dandelion are there yeah make salads, lots of berries. Um, I use maple as a natural sweetener, so I don't use any process, processed sugars. Nice. And so I'm learning on the, you know, in this journey of how to substitute some of the main ingredients that we're used to cooking with. Oh my gosh. Okay. So tell us what's kind of, you know, in the life of a chef, because uh, I would assume this isn't really, this is not necessarily for everybody. This is, it's a high pressure, high intensity uh, job when you're, when you get to a certain level, right? Um, is there favorite things that you love to create or, is, or do you kind of lose some of the ability to create some of the favorite things that you would want to be creating because, you know, there's just, you know, you got to do what, what the client's looking for, right? Well, that's the funny thing about this journey is I used to be a chef that just cooked whatever my clients wanted. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't feel fulfilled during that journey because I used to do, I had a meal prep service. And so I would only prep healthy meals that tailored to the client's taste or preference or their dietary restrictions. And so I don't do much of that anymore. And a big part of that is just because I didn't feel connected to that food. Yeah. And it wasn't until I started cooking my ancestral foods and relearning those ancestral food ways that I really started to become more passionate about, about being a chef and about being able to present these ingredients to people that have never had them before. And so luckily I'm very blessed to, yeah. you know, if no one wants me to cook my food which is indigenous fusion food then i probably won't take that job <laughs> and i have the privilege of being able to say that now and once yeah. upon a time where i was doing anything just to get the bills paid but i'm in such a beautiful place in my journey as a chef that you know i can finally say this is my spe my specialty this is my niche if anything outside of that i probably won't do for you Perfect. so i have the ability to exercise that power where i know there are some chefs out there that don't necessarily right. have that but yeah, I'm incredibly grateful. Well, there's absolutely nobody watching uh, APTN in focus who would not, who would turn down the opportunity to eat your indigenous cuisine. I can guarantee you that we are all lovers of, of those traditional foods. Okay, so now I wanna move to the show. Um, what was it like competing on Next Level Chef? And what, how was it working with Gordon Ramsay? Like, did he spaz on you at any point in time? So it's so funny. Um, 
Being on the show was an incredible experience. It was also absolutely terrifying. I bet. <laughs> just because it, it was just like such high intensity, you know, not only are you not sure what floor and what level and what kitchen you're going to be cooking at on that day, but also like what ingredients are we going to have access to? And, yeah. you know, for that bottom kitchen, what are we going to even be able to utilize in our dishes? And so when you only have 30 seconds, and so when you're looking at that platform and you know the time is ticking, you kind of blank out, you know, and you just like, just start grabbing stuff. And I can't tell you how many times I grabbed chile, like chiles, like jalapenos or a habanero or any type of chile, uh, pepper and corn. So many times, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, if I pick up an air corn one more time, but it's because I like it's your I comfort, it's out. your go to, it's your comfort in a stressful situation, it, right? Yeah. yeah, and so I'm like, okay, I gotta really start thinking outside the box a little bit. And so, um, that was really nerve wracking, but working with Gordon Ramsay was an absolutely incredible. The man is everything you think he is and more. He'll pull out a master class out of his pocket within seconds and show you how to exact, like to break down a lobster or to do something that wow. was just like mind blown. There were a few times that I, I cried, you know, like after leaving the set because I was like, oh my gosh, can't believe I like served that to him or he completely like, di you know, didn't like one of the dishes that I made. But for the most part, I think the audience and as well as the the contestants we got to see a different side of Gordon Ramsay which is more oh. of a nurturing mentoring side of him no yeah and um people ask you know is he really that mean did he yell at you and I'm like yeah but it was in an endearing way where like he cared you know and he was like obviously he's like listen to me I'm trying to teach you something and so it's more of a mentorship than wow. it was like him being angry and I thought that was a, a really amazing thing to be able to see from him and now I do know him a little bit more closely and I've had some some great conversations with him and I can say Aww. one thing about him is that he really genuinely cares beyond the, the TV scripts or you know being produced on the different shows he genuinely cares about this work and giving people like myself an opportunity and and for that I'll be forever grateful. That makes that actually warms my heart to hear that because I was one of the people who probably just thought you know what you see on TV is what you get he's just a, a jerk so I'm happy that that was not your experience. So you're offering pop-up uh, cooking classes. So I actually do um a little bit of cooking classes but most of the time they're demos and um it's more of like a visual just because now it's kind of like a bigger scale of people that i'm you're, talking to yeah but. and you're busy <laughs> and i'm busy and um but at the moment i've been able to travel across the u.s to different tribal communities and teach what i know and and also learn from them and have it be a give take relationship and so I've been able to go and, and, and present some cooking demos and do some really cool pop-up dinners and lunches for them. And so that's been really, oh. really fun. Um, are you have any plans to come up north of the medicine line? I would definitely hope so. I think the rest of this year is pretty booked, but next year I'm really hoping to be able to expand um, my horizons a little bit. I've never been up north to Canada, oh. but um, I'm really looking forward to the possibility of working with some of the tribes Oh, we love, we'd love to have you up here. I'm sure a lot of communities would be very happy to have you come by. Um, what would just last question for you, what would you, what sort of advice would you have for people who are cooking, not professional chefs, just people cooking at home for their families, people who maybe, you know, f food insecurity is a huge thing in a lot of our communities up here. Um, what advice would you, if you could speak to them, what would you, what would you say, what would you, what would you tell them to keep in mind when they're cooking up for their families and trying to be healthy? For me, I think it's really just exercising your ability to buy cookbooks that are maybe in alignment with the food that you're wanting to try to cook or research recipes or ingredients. Um, I always try to educate people on things that you can substitute out. So instead of oh. using your, you know, your pantry items they would normally find, um, you know in the store try to substitute some of them for more a little bit healthier alternatives but you can make healthy food out of canned food or out of frozen mm -hmm. foods but i would really try to avoid saturated fats you know cook cooking oils like you know fried foods and things mm -hmm. of that nature but it really just it's something that you have to practice and and learn a little bit more about and it's not something that's going to be overnight you know you're not going to wake up the next day and just 
crave a bunch of healthy stuff yeah. it's usually like taking a little time to work things into your diet and like try new things out and then kind of like leaving back leaving behind the old habits of like maybe you know frying stuff or you know try baking things instead or grilling things grilled food is actually like the best food because yeah. it's like you know it does something chemically within the meat or the food itself with the fire and i think that's a beautiful way to cook food and keep it healthy and keep it flavorful but i would definitely recommend just little by little incorporating things into your diet trying new things um I, I would study the, the shelves of your gro local grocery grocery stores and and see what you can find in there that's a little bit more of a healthier alternative and do some research on them. Yeah. But I think that's where I would definitely start. You'd mentioned cookbooks. So this will be my last question, I guess. You mentioned cookbook. Will we ever see a Piet cookbook? So I'm so excited. This is actually the first time I'm announcing it <gasps> on like a media outlet. So I actually, other than YouTube, I just recorded a first YouTube video, which was kind of an introduction to what I'm doing. Um, so it's at a Piet's Plate on YouTube. So okay. you can look out for many more videos talking about what I'm doing with a cookbook and what I'm doing with my life. And also just like who I am, you know, introducing myself to the world. But the cookbook is coming out. I just got my first cookbook deal and it is called Piet's Plates, A Celebration of Fire and Fusion. Oh my gosh. And um, briefly, I'll give a, a an ex description. Obviously, f fusion would be myself as being Native American, Mexican American, and putting both of those heritages uh, together and those cuisines together and creating really bold, beautiful dishes. But the fire aspect of it is more than just cooking with fire and the actual, you know, tangible thing of fire itself. The fire represents the spirit of indigenous people. And this book is my effort of keeping the spirit of indigenous uh, people alive. And I'm Prairie Bend Potawatomi, and we are known as the fire keepers. And what that translates to is being keepers of the fire, of keeping that spirit alive and taking on that responsibility to make sure that our traditions, whether it be for our food traditions, our ceremony, our way of life, our spiritual belief system stay alive. That's our responsibility. So with this book, I plan to uphold my responsibility on my end to do that and share indigenous ingredients um, talk about their stories, tell their stories, and share recipes that have been passed down, you know, from generations oh. to generations. And so that book is going to be so amazing. And uh, I really can't wait for it. And so um, I'm not sure when out? it's going to be I'm not exactly yeah, sure when okay. it's going to be out yet because we just, you know, I just got the deal, but typically it takes about a year for us to build it out. So I'm hoping by next November, it'll be ready for purchase. In time for Christmas the following year, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. This is, thank you. I, this was breaking news. Like I love that we, we got to be the place where you did it. This is so great, Pia, and such a pleasure to talk to you. And I, I cannot wait to see where your the world takes you from here. I'm sure Creator has big plans for you. Uh, and I hope that we get to kind of follow you around in your uh, kitchen exploits for many, many more years. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait for that cookbook to come out. Uh, well, all, chefs all have to start somewhere, and this past summer, APTN visited a lemonade stand where two 11-year-old entrepreneurs from Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario have perfected their lemonade recipe, and they're making a profit not just for themselves, but they're sharing it with others. Annette Francis brings us their story. 11-year-old Jasper Hunt is helping to set up shop. It's the second summer that Hunt has helped his buddy Hayden run the Little Punk's lemonade stand. The first critical step with every lemonade stand begins in the kitchen. Entrepreneurs Hayden Radford and Jasper only use the best ingredients. It begins with rolling the lemons. There's more juice in the lemon. It's a favorite hydrating spot. Today, a thirsty bunch of customers from the Curve Lake Day Camp arrived to taste. 11-year-old Carmela says she's been here before. Well, it's like homemade. It's pretty good. And it's really close. According to Hayden's mom, Victoria Higgs, after switching the recipe to fresh ingredients, Little Punks has become quite a hit. Okay, actually, then grab me um, 
Give me four then. It was so successful that Jasper thought it would be a great idea to donate some of the profits to the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. It would help them out a lot and it would be like, they would be thankful for it. Higgs says she's proud of the boys' dedication. Their donation goal is $500 and they're halfway there. They even gained some notoriety with a shout out on Live with Kelly and Ryan from New York City. A lot of people sending in their lemonade stands. Uh, Lauren Benson from Curve Lake, Ontario. This is my nephew Hayden getting ready for his day of selling lemonade. He and his friend Jasper do uh, such. When I heard it, um, my sister actually brought over a clip from it, and my literally my body just <laughs> went into a tingle, and uh, I had the chills from it. I didn't expect it to ever get this far and this this successful like this actually. So I'm very happy for them. Very happy. Um, Oh, that's good lemonade. You have to come try this. I'm Annette Francis at I'm Little Punk's Lemonade Stand in Curve Lake, Ontario. All right, that's all we have for you on this first episode of a new In Focus season. This episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website at aptnnews.ca backslash podcast. And if you missed any of the shows and want to check, uh, want to catch up, you can check out the website aptnnews.ca. Thank you again to all of you for tuning in. Miigwech and have a great rest of your day.